Live, we're back. Showtime, fire in the booth, mm-hmm. fire in the booth, boys. Boom in the boom, boom in the boom, boom in the boom, boom in the boom. Boom in the boom. <laughs> Sean, until birthday in a few hours, mate. How are you feeling about that? Aged, <laughs> dude. I don't know. I, I still feel 21. I, I, it's, I'm 32 tomorrow, but I, it doesn't feel like it. Interesting. Like your your hairline begs to differ. <laughs> you, beat, you beat me to it. <laughs> my hairline's my hairline's been retreating since high school, so <laughs> I was fucked from the beginning. Been retreating since the US left Nam. Exactly, <laughs> it's been a while. Before we get into oh, the man. meat and potatoes and veg and uh, and Malva pudding of this episode, uh, did you see there's a new Mortal Kombat movie coming out? Mm-hmm. We did. Dude, we what did. are we saying about that? I cannot uh, wait. I'm I'm stressed. I I, I genuinely, as a as a movie fan, that stresses me out, because like Dragon Ball Z, someone fucked it up. Like all these, I enjoyed like, that. No, on no it, it those classic like movies that you go back to our day where I mean they're shit even in the past, but it was our childhood and we loved it growing up. But Are you talking I, about the the live action one? All of them. All these no, remakes no, no, no. are absolutely shocking, and I'm genuinely scared someone fucks up Mortal Kombat because that was that was prime childhood. The I mean, they've, they've they've fucked it up many times already. <laughs> yeah. Um, I I I've, I love the trailer. Like, mm. I I wet myself a little bit when I watched it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I've also seen many trailers that good, and uh, they turn out to be a, a pile of dog shit. Uh, Power Rangers, for example, the latest Power oh. Rangers. Um, like I so said, I'm... another 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 ruin <laughs> franchise. It killed me watching that. Well, that's that's why I'm somewhat skeptical about the end product because um, I've seen too many of our '90s treasures being ruined with modern remakes. But mm-hmm. skepticism aside, like the novelty of this trailer and seeing all the all the all the characters and the heroes, I'm pretty excited for it. I'll, so. I'll still be at yeah. the front of the queue, man. It's can't yeah, help me it. Me too. Definitely gonna watch it. <laughs> If you haven't seen the trailer, go check it out. It's pretty fucking badass. Yeah, I don't think you can find that on strictlyfighters.com, but there's a lot of other things you can find out in there. So, mm. <laughs> shameless play. play. Sh- shameless play. play. All right. <laughs> All right, UFC 259 recap. Let's start with the main event. Um, Jan outstriking Izzy by 184 strikes to 99 and landing more significant strikes than Izzy, plus Beautiful. those three takedowns. Uh, complete domination on the ground. What are the thoughts, boys? Who 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 called this? By the way, did anyone call Jan winning? No, I think all three of us no. were wrong. And no, no, yeah, yeah, we yeah, we all thought Izzy was going to take this one. Yeah, yeah. So let's. I mean, let's talk about the complete domination on the ground, right? And what this brings us back to is potentially revisiting the conversation about weight. How much does weight factor in? in MMA and at the elite level in competitions such as the UFC. Mm. So what, what weight did uh, Jan actually go into the ring on? I don't, I don't think they measure that, right? So yeah, yeah. no, not what they walked in the ring yeah. on. I don't think they do measure that on the day of the fight, but, but he weighed in at 205 mm. um, and Izzy weighed in at, I think, 201. Yeah, it was, was 201. He said he yeah, would be. yeah, it was 201.5, but uh, I'm sure Jan probably went in at what, 220? Because that that's kind of it's closer to his natural weight, so he wouldn't have gone he in at twenty five. So it's a substantial he definitely went in difference. heavier. Yes. Yeah. Oh, definitely, definitely. Substantial difference. So once again, for me, weight makes a huge difference at the highest level. But it if we're, we're saying if we're saying that he outstruck Izzy, that's got nothing to do with weight. Um, yeah. So y- yes, when he was when they were on the ground, he was dominating Izzy. But that's what any black belt would do to a new purple belt. In fact, a lot mm-hmm. of B- people in the BJJ community don't believe he deserves his purple belt. Uh, he just wasn't a blue belt for long enough. Um, so he so, ju- it really did just look like a black belt dominating a very, very green purple belt. So, Sean, talk us through this in a little bit more detail. Because for me, um, as somebody who exists and operates outside the realm of BJJ, what it looks like is that... On the ground, weight definitely matters. That's what it looks like watching from from a layman's perspective, I guess. And I also feel like 
that's not necessarily in these fights, but at some stage, right, weight on the ground plays a massive role, the bigger the difference in weight becomes between two opponents. Because at some point, no matter how much knowledge, technique, and leverage that you can employ, you're just not going to get up if somebody who's 15 to 20 grams, 20 kilograms heavier than you is lying on top of you and has a semblance of, or a semblance of an idea of how to operate on the ground. Especially a black belt. Um, so it's when you're on the ground, yeah, definitely. Uh, weight does matter. I mean, myself, I, when I'm when I'm training, the most of the people I'm training against are heavier than me. It's just it's just a fact of life. Um, and yeah, obviously, the, the heavier they are, uh, the the more they're able to use their weight against me. However, there is an element of speed that 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 you have to take into account. I can very often dominate people that are larger than me, applying my adjective speed agility um this is a jiu-jitsu game this is purely jiu-jitsu no strikes involved yon did a very good job of keeping izzy on the ground in half guard uh, in a position that's difficult to escape out of it requires you to um engage your bottom either your legs or your upper body one either to keep the person away or at bay but in the mms you shouldn't be doing that you should be keeping them in close um, to prevent the strikes from having any power. So it's sort of the opposite of what you would do, be doing in, uh, in BJJ. In BJ, BJJ, you'll be keeping a guy off of you using your, using your shields. In MMA, it's the opposite. You want to keep the guy as close as possible until you can get into a more advantageous position. Because of the threat of strikes. Exactly, exactly. So mm-hmm. that's what was keeping uh, that's what was keeping Izzy at bay is is the strikes of of uh, of Jan. He he just kept him in a really good half guard, um, stayed heavy on that leg that was between his legs, and just kept pounding away whenever whenever Izzy tried to do anything from that position. Obviously, apart from the striking game, but we're talking mm-hmm. get ground. It had less to do with the weight. I think, and more to do with his ability to control Izzy on the ground. That that you, you might think that that size difference is is a lot on, on the ground. It 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 is only a big difference when there's a much bigger difference in in, in terms of yeah. weight. It was it really was a difference of skill rather than a difference of weight when it came to mm-hmm. to who dominated that fight on the ground. He just he just was a black belt against a very fresh. Do you uh, do you think belt. mentally? that Izzy went in there thinking that he is heavier than me and um, I cannot let him get close enough to take me down because then I'm going to have a problem. And that's one of the reasons Izzy didn't get as many strikes in because he was keeping a serious distance between him and Jan. Yeah, well, Jan was pushing constantly. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Izzy's normally, one that, normally the one that sets the pace. So Jan was changing the game for him. I, I think... I think- something slightly different i think that izzy employed his natural game which is a distance game which is a mastery of distance management Mm. of timing and of speed be under the under the threat of ian's knockout power i think that's what that's Mm. that more than anything is why izzy employed the use of his natural game but to a heightened level or at a heightened state Mm. I think on the that, ground, that, Izzy backed himself. I think, um, the, you know, with the guys that he was training with, Sean, you talked about it in last week's podcast, and um, just the level that he is as a mixed martial artist, I think he backed himself on the ground. I don't think it was a state, of, um, a case of him specifically saying in his mind or in his game plan that, okay, we're not going to um, get close and we're going to try and maintain distance for fear of a takedown. I think it was more for fear of getting 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 caught with one of Jan's Polish power haymakers. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean that, that's a fair point. Um, however, I mean, Izzy put a lot of training into his grappling uh, for mm-hmm. this fight. The fact he, he knew that, um, he, he knew the, the advantage Jan had over him on the ground. Um, I think the reason he kept him at distance like that is because of the fear of, of getting taken to the ground because that's where his natural game is is on the feet that's where he's going to stand the best chance of winning um no matter how much he backed himself on the ground he had the least chance of winning on the ground so he's mm. always going to try and keep it on his feet that he's a kickboxer he's a, he's a muay thai mm. or kickboxing specialist mm. so he's always going to be trying to keep that game there yeah I, that's that's what happened i mean he just tried to keep it at distance and just try to and he's a good god good Take down defense, easy. I mean, mm. let's, let's not let's not fault that, but he just couldn't keep you on off he, of him. But he also mentioned in his post-fight interview that um, he was fighting for points. His his punches weren't strong enough to kind of do enough damage to Jan to take him down. So he was 
boxing for points. So he was no, just he tagging never said him. That. He, he did. He, I promise you now, I mentioned that he was trying to get some points out of it. I, I, I rewatched that interview three times now. <laughs> Where, which interview is that? In, the, in his post-fight interview or in the post-fight press no, conference? No, the presser in the press conference. No, I, I think you're slightly misrepresenting what he was saying. I don't think Israel Adesanya would ever come out and say that he was fighting for points. I think that there was a, a period in the fight where he kind of realized what was happening and that he would need to win rounds if he wasn't going to get Jan out of there. But I, I don't think it's as simple as the way that you're putting it. Okay. However, well, I haven't enough. I haven't heard the interview. I haven't heard the interview. Well, so. on on those on those fuck points, me, I could be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So fuck you. Uh, but the <laughs> the the other thing that he brought up was quite an interesting thing. Was uh, I believe there's another uh, fighting league that actually, when you go into your corner after a round, they actually inform you where you're sitting with points. And I believe they don't do this in the UFC. And he said, yeah, like, why aren't we doing that? And he, he made that quite a point in the post-fight presser. So that's quite an interesting one too. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's, it could, be, it could be a very cool addition to, to the promotion um, if they're hmm. doing it elsewhere in the sport. Yeah, okay, sure. let, okay let's, let's say they do that. But <laughs> the controversy around the way the judges have judged fights in the past has been has been unreal there's been huge issues with the way that the, that, that fights in the past have been judged mm -hmm. imagine telling a fighter after a round that everyone thought he was up on points he's now down on points what's what's mm -hmm. that going to do to him mentally yeah but that but uh, it depends take it how you, take it how it comes like either you mm -hmm. either it's going to ruin you mentally and you're going to be like what what the fuck more do i need to do to be winning this fight mm -hmm. or you're going to be like okay shit this is the reality of the situation here are the adjustments that I have to make if I want to get ahead on what matters, which is the judges' scorecards. Mm. So maybe yeah. that brings a whole new, yeah. a whole new element of mental strength and mentality into the game. Mm. Now, also, I mean, does that does that make them more likely to fight for the points? Does it more, make them more likely to fight like like Mayweather does? You know what I mean? How does it change their game? Finishes. <laughs> How does it change their game? Do they become more cautious because they're ahead now? Um, I, I I like that they don't tell. Um, people between rounds <laughs> I, what the I've, points are i've got another interesting thing that was a, a very big note of this fight was and i love joe rogan and dan and them and what they've done for the sport and um the the knowledge they bring to the commentating but it, there was a clear bias on the night mm. clear clear bias and, and and it's horrible to see but but isn't there always especially in this fight right like yeah. remember the stats that i read to you in the beginning uh jan outstruck izzy by yeah. by total strikes mm. and by significant strikes and significantly it's a good 30 percent it wasn't a small margin and yet i never once heard the commentators talking about jan's striking every time izzy landed anything they would almost corroborate the fact mm. uh in terms of how great a striker izzy is so mm. i i picked that up i did as well <laughs> They were, yeah, they, I mean, they're always going to have. They're fans of the fighting game, and they're always going to have some sort of bias, also for marketing purposes. It, yeah, yeah um, uh, Izzy is a is an is a is an easy individual to brand rather than Jan, who's more introverted and and doesn't really care about the spotlight. Yeah, f yeah, for sure. But then there comes the other thing: was as soon as the fight was over, the first interview was Izzy. Usually, you interview the winner of the fight, get the feedback, and he interviewed uh, Joe Rogan interviewed Izzy first and that that's blatant and the fans ha have picked that up trust me online is a mess right now it doesn't it doesn't change the fact for the promotion whether Izzy won or lost her that he is the most marketable aspect of yeah he got paid the, the most <laughs> He's, he, you know what I mean like so what so what really like yeah. Jan still got the products as a champion uh if yeah. Jan doesn't get the products as as a champion as Izzy does for example in the middleweight division or as Izzy would have gotten well, that's, you know, that's not necessarily only down to the promotion. That's because Jan is, let's be honest, a bit of a boring guy. Like he's very cool and very charming and he's a, he's a nice person and he's a, an incredible fighter, but do you know what I mean? He's not, he's not, he's not Israel Adesanya. So yeah, but I don't know. I, I, I hear what people are saying. Um, but if I was being, being, a, being a brand guy and be working in marketing my whole career, I would have done the same thing. Yeah, mm. but it brings new meaning to the put some respect on my name. <laughs> that that's what it's come down to that yeah. it, 
that a lot of people just feel like that is a complete disrespect to the actual champion. But and let's be fair though. Let's be fair though. The the biggest sort of talking factor when it comes to fights is the underdog, the underdog and the favorites. If if you had the promotion boosting or promoting both guys equally, it wouldn't be as big a fight because you don't have the superstar going up against the underdog or the champion who's being underestimated. Um, it's all about the storyline. And, and the UFC are one of, if not the best storytellers in the world from a, mm. from a content marketing and content creation perspective at this time. You don't even have to love UFC. In fact, you don't even have to watch UFC. If you watch a countdown episode um, or consume or, mm. or, watch, or watch like a hype trailer, you don't have to know the fighters. You don't have to know the whole background and the story just by mm. virtue of the content they create and the, the narratives that they weave and the plot lines that, mm. um, you know, govern the way that they build and, and market fights. You're, you're into it. You're like, oh, shit. Okay, mm. I get the immediate cracks of, of what's happening here. This is a great matchup. I want to watch this fight. Yeah, it's like it's like every fight in the UFC is like a Rocky movie. Like <laughs> they they've got the sto the life stories of every single fighter, and I mean they're they're really inspiring. Some of them are really really inspiring. Yeah. But yeah, the UFC really from, know how from, to use that. From a brand perspective, I completely get it. But from a fans purist kind of thing, it 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 hurt the fans for some reason. Like and, you, Craig. and it shows. I could not <laughs> give a shit because I I'm an Izzy fan. So I was like, yeah, t tell them, tell them, it's all good. But yeah. No. It's an interesting uh, one. Shona, I want to take it back to your explanation of the loss and uh, Jan's domination on the ground. Because we've got a really cool, what I think is a novel idea on strictlyfighters.com on our blog, which is flowcharts. The use of flowcharts um, to help and improve and govern your training and improvement in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Mm. Tell us a little bit more about this. Yeah, so I mean, Jay, you've had some experience with jiu-jitsu, right? And uh, you yourself said the the curriculum for jiu-jitsu is insane. Um, it's crazy. So from every position, there are several moves. There are several counters to those moves, and there are several counters to those counters. So, so it's like the way the analogy I use is like a, a tree branching out. Right? You've got mm -hmm. the tree, you've got the core, and then you've got a branch. And then out of that branch sprouts another branch, and out of that branch sprouts six more branches, and so on and so forth. Yeah, and that's yeah, what absolutely. that's what in, that's what the curriculum of BJJ can be likened to, especially for a beginner who's kind of coming into it wide-eyed and bushy-tailed and been like, "Holy shit, what the fuck? How am I ever going to understand all of these things?" Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So th there's two sort of principles when it comes to jujitsu. There's um, one being able to generalize, being able to be comfortable in various positions, all the positions, understanding where to go from them, um, where to look for submissions, where to look for for uh, counters and things like that in general. It's not required to be an expert at each of these things. But if you look at high level competitors, they've all got a certain thing that they do, a certain pattern of movements that they do. They've got a certain pass. They've got a certain uh, method of control. They've, they've got a certain sequence of submissions that they will go for. And they will train this religiously because this is their game plan and they'll they'll apply their game plan. And it's sort of it's, a, it's sort of a well-known thing. So if you know a certain fighter, you, you'll sort of know what their game plan is. A lot of them will have sweeps named after them. A lot of them will have submissions named after them because this is the, 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 the path to victory that they've selected. Like the Kimura. Like the Kimura, like the mm. De La Hiva, like they, there's a whole bunch of moves in Jiu-Jitsu that are either named after people or named by people that mm. invented those positions or not invented, but discovered because these positions can't be invented. They just, yeah, it's the beauty of Jiu-Jitsu. So mm -hmm. as, as amateurs, as people who are looking to improve, um, the variety of different techniques, different movements from different positions can be overwhelming. And the, the process of trying to perfect each of these um, it's it's gonna it's gonna leave you an average. It's it's gonna uh, result in you being an average grappler, average grappler because you're pretty good at some things, but not really good at anything specific. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's like anything else. I mean, even uh, and we've quoted this before, but uh, what's his name? Um, Bruce Lee said, "I I fear not the man who's practiced ten thousand kicks. I fear the man who's practiced ten thousand kicks uh, uh, at uh, one kick ten thousand times." Same thing when it comes mm -hmm. to the route that you take to victory in jiu-jitsu. 
you need to get good at a pass or at least one or two passes so that if the one gets shut down, you've got another option to go to. Uh, you need to be able to control in a certain position. You need to understand different co uh, control positions. Do you prefer getting to the back very quickly and controlling from there? Do you prefer getting to mount and controlling from there or side control controlling from there, north, south? So these are all very different positions and all have very different submissions um, from those different positions. So being able to understand what my highest percentage uh, moves are from various positions is the most important thing when it comes to improving quickly in jiu-jitsu because you can work on just that movement just that pattern just that flow um, to get to uh, and this is also good because you are dictating what you're looking to do in a fight you're not just taking what comes to you um, which a lot of people get into the habit of i get into the habit of that as well i i sort of take submissions when they come i defend 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 until someone shows me a vulnerability and then i take that from them um, as, a, as opposed to constructing your own path to victory, basically. Exactly, exactly. So I have... It's a very reactive sort of, process rather than pro proactive. Exactly. And, and there's arguments for the fact that that's a good thing. It's, it's the equivalent of a counterpuncher in, in, in boxing. So, um, but it's not good to only be good at that. You want to be able to set a path and be able to tell the person, I'm going to choke you out from behind. There's nothing you can do about that. And you want to be able to pull that off. Um, and in flowcharts, it essentially allow you to do that. It allows you to map out what you're looking to do. Start here. If I, if I uh, screw up this technique, I've got this one to fall back on. And you know this because you've planned it out on paper. Um, and if I get to, for example, if I get the pass right and I'm in side control, what do I do from here? I've got two options according to my mind map, according to my flow chart that I've worked out. If this one doesn't work, then this one should work. Mm -hmm. And you just jump between these two sort of submissions or these passes or these, um, these techniques or movements. So flow charts have been very, very useful. It is, like you said, a very novel idea uh, when it comes to fighting and it's perfect for something like jujitsu. Um, but if you, if you want to know more about it, I've actually included it in a blog post of mine called uh, it's learning jujitsu uh, by yourself. So learning BJJ by yourself. So if you just go on to uh, strictlyfighters.com, that article will be there. Uh, it's near the bottom somewhere where we talk about mind maps. And we also link to a pretty cool um, um, uh, company that, that actually sells mind maps. So uh, one's based on, on famous fighters, one's based on famous instructionals that you're able to buy. But this is actually... Um, the techniques put down on paper for you to understand exactly where you're going to from these various positions. So yeah, go have a read. It's on, it's on the blog. So it actually gives you like a, for, for those people who enjoy a bit of studying, it's a theoretical knowledge before you get into the practice of it. It's quite, yeah. quite a cool, quite a cool process that. Nice. Exactly. And, and this company BJJ flow chart, uh, charts that we use, they they don't only give you the the, the flowchart on paper to work with. They actually give you the videos of the transitions mm -hmm. and the movements. So it's an entire instructional along with um, along with the mind map or the or the, mm -hmm. the flowchart. I say mind map because it's very South African. But yeah, along with the flowchart, you get videos as well. Really really cool. We can use cool. spider diagram too. <laughs> spider diagram too. All right, nice. Uh, let's get back to UFC 259 then. Um, let's chat quickly about the most controversial fight of the evening. Um, Piotr No Mercy Jan versus Aljamain Funkmaster Sterling. I do believe uh, I called this one, but I'm not proud of it. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you did. You did, but you, never, you would never have called the way it ended, did you? Um, no, I definitely would not. Although, having said that, uh, so Aljo, Aljo actually outstruck Jan. Mm. Um, and which none of us expected, uh, but obviously Jan had seven takedowns versus uh, Aljamain's one. So it's kind of a reversal of what we were what we were previewing, isn't it? In terms of a, the classic striker versus grappler debate, yeah, they 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 kind of reversed the roles a little bit. Um, amazing fight as it was going on and mm. as it was happening. But then for anyone who doesn't know um, or who missed it or is looking for, or is looking to kind of understand a little bit more about what happened. Uh, Peter Jan was disqualified for a knee to the head while Aljamain Sterling was grounded. Um, if, now, if, if you go watch that video back, first of all, in slow motion, when they break it down, anyone who says he's acting, Go watch that in slow motion. The guy's head snaps back. That almost hit, his head almost hits his back. That's how hard he's kneed him in the head. That yeah. that is concussion material right there. There seems to be a lot of confusion around the rule though, like uh, they, they, because obviously different different promotions have different rules, and a lot of people are getting this confused. Yeah, so, so uh, that that's one of the questions I had. Was mm -hmm. actually, for example, 
uh, where you have Derek Lewis's fight a couple, uh, two weeks ago, whatever, two, three weeks ago. When the man goes down, he can physically throw his body on the guy, elbow him, and beat the living shit out of him on the ground. Our guy's out cold, but he can still keep hitting him till the ref gets there. But mm-hmm. um, Elgin was, was on his knees, still kind of in a position. I get that the ref said he's done, but it, isn't that the opportunity to finish him? I don't understand why the knee's not allowed to be thrown when it can be thrown at any other point. So let's clear it up, right? Um, and basically what, what the UFC operates under is a document called the Unified Rules of MMA. Uh, the, the issue is that they're anything but unified. So... <laughs> Uh, base, and this is something that was obviously missing in the early days of MMA, right? Uh, MM, the MMA has actually evolved to become a, well, I wouldn't say a safe sport, but as safe as it is humanly possible to compete in full contact, mm. no holds barred, mixed martial arts. About sport. as safe as American football. Yeah, Safer, yeah. I would say, because you're not that, running full charge into someone head first. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's, that's a debate I'll leave you to have with American football. <laughs> sure. um, but basically all UFC bouts are now, governed with full adherence to to the the provisions that are set forth in the unified rules of mma mm-hmm. right so let's see so uh, in rule rule number 12 under the foul section kneeing and or kicking the head of a grounded opponent a grounded fighter is defined as any part of the body other than a single hand and soles of the feet touching the fighting area floor so to be grounded you either have to have both hands that are palm or fist down and any other part of the body touching the fighting area floor. So if you have two feet on the floor and both hands palm down mm. or fist down grounded, you are a grounded fighter and kicks or knees to the head are not allowed. Mm. Right. Um, so a single knee arm makes the fighter grounded without having to have any other body part in touch with the fighting area floor. Already, this is getting Mm. complicated, right? Now, hold on, I'm not even finished. The original unified rules, going back to 2001, stated that anything but the soles of the feet being on the mat constituted a grounded fighter. In other words, a fighter could put a single hand or finger down and be considered grounded. So they had two, let's say they're on their feet. If a fighter reached down and put their finger on on the canvas, they were considered grounded. Mm. Now, in 2016, the Rules and Regulations Committee changed this um, and they passed a new rule via a majority vote um, because of the thought that fighters were gaming the provision um, and using it to slow down fights and basically Mm. protect themselves from, you know, crazy damage and 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 kicks to the head. Exactly. Um, So the new definition from 2017 onwards is the one that states that a fighter must now have both hands, palms or fists down on the ground in order to be grounded, unless a knee or anything other than the soles of the feet are also down. So if you're on your knees, you are grounded, right? It's only that it's only, it was only to change the fact that you can't put a finger down or one hand down Mm. to be considered grounded. If you're going to use your hands, you have to have both down intentionally. Okay. Mm -hmm. And at any of these times, if a fighter is considered grounded, a knee, or kick to the head to that fighter is illegal. But to to compound this even further, during the 2016 rule change, the Nevada Athletic Commission, right, which is where most of the the UFC fights take place, Mm. it's where the Apex is, it's where the UFC is based in in Vegas, they initially uh, did not accept this new definition of a fighter being grounded. So they adopted the new unified rules of MMA, with the provision that we're not going to uh, accept this one clause or this one provision. Mm. So now you had the old rules, you had the new rules, and then you have this hybrid rule in Nevada. Look, according to both definitions, the fundamental basis of the rule is that three points on the ground is considered a fighter grounded or downed, which is what Sterling was. If you see, uh, Peter Mm. Jan was actually holding both his hands, uh, but he had both his feet on the ground and one knee on the ground at the point that the Mm. strike hit. So either way, uh, it's illegal. Mm. There's no dispute about the fact that the technique that was executed was illegal. However, Mm. you can now understand why there is such a furore Mm. around it and why there's so Mm. much confusion around it. I I, I get that, but... As a professional athlete who's been in the game for how many how many fights is Jan in now, in the MMA? That he, he's he's quite deep into that, right? So 
someone like that who is a defending champion the guy's on his knees literally like almost begging for his life he's grounded he can literally do anything to him there he can elbow him out cold he can put a fist through his face and he decides to put a knee into his head as a professional you have to have the presence of mind to be like i will be disqualified if i put a knee through this like's head even and, if it's debatable yeah 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 you shouldn't even you shouldn't even go close to that there was no need for the knee uh, i mean i i've seen rumors online where where um joe rogan says that he heard from khabib that his corner actually instructed the illegal move now i don't know how 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 is it is it factual is it true why would it why would they do that i don't think it's been factually confirmed and it was also in russian uh, which is mm. why khabib was the one to to mm. relay the message yeah. but uh, it seems like it's pretty common knowledge yeah so so, so yeah, I mean, that, that begs it, it, the that question. That was very intentional. Yeah, that was very intentional. So that begs the question is, it, does that mean fight's fixed? Does that, what, what does that mean? If they are instructing that, what is the end result of that? I don't think it's fight fixed. Um, I have no idea why would they would do that. <laughs> That's I have weird. no idea. Because the only result would be disqualification if, uh, if uh, um, Sterling wasn't able to get up and Sterling was, he, he was a proper footballer in this one, guys, a <laughs> soccer player. He really, really milked that, that illegal move. He could have gotten up and carried on fighting. Yeah. Uh, Listen, even, though, even, the though head he, sucked. even though he was well within his rights. I mean, there was a case, he was. In a, in, there was a case in a title fight, uh, I think a year back or a couple of years back where uh, John Jones was fighting Anthony Lionheart Smith. And a very similar thing occurred, but Anthony Smith chose to carry on uh, and he lost the fight and he never became a UFC champion. So, yeah. you know, who, I think it's a, an even bigger debate in terms of is the abuse that Aljamain Sterling is copying at the moment warranted? <laughs> um, because the fact is within the rules of MMA, he was well within his rights mm. to do what he do. And by virtue of the fact that the rules is rules, as we say in South Africa, he is the bantamweight uh, flyweight champion bantamweight champion of the world so so, yeah. so, so here's the other point that's currently splitting the internet down the middle is what happened what happens in that situation should he be crowned the the champion or should the belt be completely voided no one's champion and they set up a new fight kind of thing so Who what competes what, for it then yeah I, I don't know i mean dana white will find a way but it, that's that's the question: is does it get voided? Because... But that 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 um, but that sort of defeats the object of an illegal move. If if you're just going to avoid the fight because the the uh, one fighter made, did something illegal, now you're punishing the guy who didn't do something illegal. No, you, I completely agree with efforts. you. Yeah, so I, I, I think the rules are rules. Um, I think Aljamain is completely within his rights, but it's a mm. deb debate between um martial artists and i suppose that's that's not fair they're all martial artists but it's a de it's a debate between people who are purists who want to see a fight to the death with blood and people who actually mm. consider the rules to be the word but i mean i i, I tend to be on the side of, of the people who want the blood uh, because it's a fight you came here to fight you didn't come here to win on a technicality if you can still fight a fight is a fight and I mean, the whole spirit of what we do is 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 essentially fighting to the death. Unless the ref mm. stops you, unless the ref stops you because you're you're out, unless it's a TKO because you can't defend yourself anymore, unless you're out because it's a knockout, unless you tap because you literally are submitted, that's how a fight is supposed to end. Not because someone made, did an illegal illegal move. Fine, if if he got the knee to the head and he really was dazed and had to carry him out on a stretcher, fine. But you could obviously see. Algermain was absolutely fine. He Man was, was sitting over. on a chair during the final uh, announcement. <laughs> he was absolutely fine. So uh, he's well within his rights, but I can't respect him as a champion, at least not yet. Yeah, unless he defended you, but, it. But did you die? <laughs> that's the question. <laughs> but that everyone's. A, but that's a question everyone's asking him. But did you die? Mm. Uh, and a lot, a lot of people are asking that same question. Uh, what DC came out in his statement saying that is in poor taste. The fact that he's posing with that belt. He's like, yeah. that's just, you should, that's, you just shouldn't be, take yeah, the win, that it's was fine. Also, that was also taken out of context, like, and he explained that in, 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 in that, like he was with, you know, all his family and friends flew out yeah, for the fight. Uh, he was with them afterwards. I don't know how the photo was leaked or I don't, he didn't post it, 
One of his uh, family as, members as, don't like him. As far him. as I know. <laughs> um, but, you know, he wasn't posting about posing with it and being like, I'm the champion. If you listen to him speak, you can tell 1000% as well that he doesn't believe, you know, his championship status is legitimized until they go at it again. Mm. And he beats him in a fair and square um, bout. Mm. And, you know, counterintuitively in terms of the, the indecision around this rule, because there's been because there's been so much uh, hype and and indecision around it, you should know as a fighter in the UFC, out of all the fucking rules that exist, <laughs> how this one goes and what you can and can't do. So yeah. you know you know what I mean. Um, mm. It's one of the biggest the debated same, rules. It, it really same, is. So you should yeah. know. And but mm. by the same token, like you know, for 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 Peter Yan in in his not his, in his, well yeah in his defense. You know, he committed the illegal move. He got DQ'd. He lost his belt. Yeah. So it. you know, the punishment befits the crime, and and you know, yeah. he's also the, and that's it. So at the end of the day, you know, be, with the rules being the rules, the, I think the UFC handled it well. I think the mm -hmm. referee handled it well. I think everyone around the situation handled it well. And with the rules being the rules, the outcome is what it should have been. Now that now I'm that you've bad, seen that yeah. fight, who would you back for round two? It's difficult to say, man. I think oh, Yon oh, I mean, was dominating. Definitely, definitely yeah. Piotr. On paper, um, he wasn't. That's yeah, the, that's paper, the thing. Yeah, but like, come on. A, a few punches landed. Yeah, I know, but the, the, a few punches landed a lot cleaner than what Sterling's did, and that's what dazed him. I think if it comes down to it again, Sterling, knowing what he's going into, I think Sterling will take it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what happened that's is right important. <laughs> I think what happened is important for the the the, the sport of martial arts, uh, or sports, sport of uh, of MMA, um, because it shows people who are competing the risk of an illegal move. It takes you completely out of competition. It, it mm. nullifies every single minute, every single second you've put into your training camp mm. because you decided to do something stupid. I mean, fine. If if this is the way that people needed a bit of a wake up call. Here's your wake up call. Wake the wake the fuck up. You know what I mean. Mm. Stop mm. fucking around with stupid techniques and knees to the head while the ground person is grounded. Even if it's debatable. Even if his mm. knees slightly off the slightly off the off, off the off the canvas. Do not even uh, don't, even, don't even put yourself into that situation. Yeah, I no saw, one wants uh, VAR in MMA. <laughs> 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 I saw a quote from uh, Mighty Mouse Demetrius Johnson, where he was basically saying that he thinks this rule should be abolished completely that knees to, and, and kicks uh, to the face while, an, while an opponent is grounded should be legal because he echoes the sentiment that having this technique illegal stores the fight. So fighters can ground themselves uh, to gain some kind of an advantage or store the fight. Yeah. Uh, and that obviously detracts from the spectacle. So, I mean, the big, a big thing about a fight is not leaving yourself in vulnerable situations. That's a vulnerable situation. You don't want to use that as, a, as an in-between position. I mean, everything Mighty Mouse says is gospel to me, so I completely agree. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree with that. But you, you get into a ring, you're a big guy, get into a ring with John Jones and you're in a compromising position and John Jones puts a knee or a foot through your face while you're in that position. You might just. What are you? Dead. What are you doing why, in the ring? Why, with, yeah, you why know? you're in the? Why are you in your in that position in the first place? Well, <laughs> we've we've just seen how a title contender can get in that position, and yeah, you okay, might somebody die. Somebody's own weight. Uh, I'm not that's, saying that's, that you. Like I said, no. a larger bloke gets in the ring. No, yeah, but that's that, that's completely out of context. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> I, I just think when you're going up against big guys like that, and you get into a compromising position, which we've seen is very possible now. Death is almost imminent if they land that correctly. Well, that's why the yeah. rules exist, is to protect fighters. So, But did yeah, he I die? That's saying. the thing. <laughs> but did he die? <laughs> okay, so... What's it, what's it? IT crowd. Death. Yeah. Death is coming. <laughs> <laughs> Carry on, sir. Yes, let's get to the third title fight of the night. Amanda the, Ni the Lioness <laughs> Nunez versus Man. Megan Anderson. I Amanda didn't get touched. She didn't get touched in this fight. They have, uh, uh, on the official record, they have uh, Megan Anderson landing two strikes. I don't know if you saw them because I didn't. <laughs> they were being <laughs> generous. <laughs> yeah. Amanda hasn't lost in five years, right? She's had seven title defenses now. 
five at uh, bantamweight at 135 pounds, two now at featherweight at 145 pounds. Mm -hmm. um, guys, who who is left to challenge this woman? Who's who is she going to fight next? I, I don't I don't see anyone in the division, but apparently the internet believes um, Valentina. So is this the is the only what, contender. This is what I've heard: is that uh, inside the UFC, the only real viable options are Dana was talking about Juliana Pena, the Venezuelan vixen. Mm. But I mean, she's she's number she's the number six ranked bantamweight. Uh, she's ten and four in the UFC. Uh, I. I that is as much a mismatch to me as the Megan Anderson fight was. Mm. Um, she's she lost to Jermaine uh, Duranime. She lost to Valentina. So yeah. if but I look, she's at just inside, called her out. Pen has just called her out, saying that she's too scared to take on because of her wrestling prowess. So I didn't see that. That's interesting. Yeah. So I, I don't she, know. she must uh, she she must be a fucking sucker for punishment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, Craig, to your point, I think the only other person inside the UFC that could challenge her would be uh, Valentina mm. Shevchenko mm. Uh, at 135, even though she is a natural 125 pounder. Uh, she's a natural flyweight. So mm. obviously they would meet at, at 135. So just to, just to lay it out on the line for everyone who's listening, in the female, uh, in the women's weight divisions in the UFC, you have 115 pounds, which is straw weight. Right, you have 125 pounds, which is fly flyweight. You have uh, 135 pounds, which is bantamweight, and then you have 145 pounds, which is featherweight. Those are the divisions. Amanda is the featherweight champion, so at the heaviest, and the bantamweight champion, mm -hmm. uh, the second heaviest. Valentina is the uh, she is the 125 pound champion. She's the flyweight champion, mm -hmm. which is the division below uh, Amanda's lowest which means that she would have to come up to meet Amanda at 135, right? Now, before this podcast, when I was thinking about this and doing a little bit of research, I went and watched the fights between Valentina and Amanda because they've already fought twice, huh? Mm. And dude, Valentina Shevchenko pushed Amanda. She pushed mm. her to the scorecards twice. Uh, mm. And the second title, the second one, which was a title fight, was a split decision. And man, I don't... Like Valentina has come on in leaps and bounds, number one. She's uh, more technically gifted, in my opinion, than Amanda from a striking perspective and from a martial arts perspective. Her speed, her fight IQ, and her toughness and ruthlessness. Like when I watch mm. her face going against Amanda, like she wasn't scared. Mm. She was mm. not scared. Like she can hang, man. She can hang in there with, uh, uh, with Amanda. Now, the, the only other thing that I could see, the only other option, uh, and I'd love to get your guys' thoughts on this, is why the fuck did she not get a rematch with Chris Cyborg? Okay? Mm. And hear me out. I don't understand why this never happened, right? <clears throat> Cyborg is 23-2 and two in MMA, in mixed martial arts. The only fight she's ever lost was her first ever fight, uh, which I think was back in 2005 or something stupid, and her, her loss to Amanda, right? She had, she had two title defenses in the UFC. She was pretty much undisputedly the greatest of all time in, in mm. women's MMA until she lost to Amanda. Super dominant. Like she used to more women the same way that Amanda's doing now, mm. right? How did she never get an instant rematch? She's currently in Bellator. She's fighting in Bellator. She's the featherweight champion mm. uh, in Bellator. Uh, and she is also the only Grand Slam champion in, in, in MMA history, fe yeah. female or male. And basically what that means is... is She's won world champions across four major MMA promotions. She's mm -hmm. the only one in, in MMA history to have done that. So Juliana, so, Valentina, Chris Cyborg, what are we saying? Yeah, so um, if you have a look at the circumstances surrounding Cyborg's departure from the UFC, you'll understand why she wasn't given a rematch. Um, I, I can't remember the story exactly, but her manager started some shit um, with, uh, with Dana White and uh, she allowed it to happen. And as a result of, I can't remember exactly what happened. As a result of that, she had to leave the UFC and obviously sign on with, with Bellator. 
Um, yeah, I would have loved to have seen a, a rematch of that because I remember actually waiting and watching that fight. It was crazy. Uh, th- th- those strikes, I mean, Cyborg was on, on the fence mm-hmm. just trying to defend for her life and Nunes just wah, 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 took it down, yeah. came back up, took it down again. That was, oh, but, man. but Nunes hits like a truck, man. I say Jeez. take it so down. Cyborg. She knocked so it does out. Cyborg, though, dude. Fair. Mm. Man, I, I would I would get knocked out from a punch by Nunes. Holy shit. But Most I, I, men you know would. Ooh, Most I like men this. Men I like Ooh. this. Ooh. Uh, I okay. saw a tweet. I saw it. Yeah, Sean. I think we're mm. on the same the same wavelength. I saw a tweet from <laughs> Cub Swanson after the after the card, and he was suggesting get Amanda Nunes to fight the guys. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, and, and I heard and I heard uh, uh, from Dana as well that when he was talking about her fight camp coming into this card, like she was flooring male sparring partners in the gym. Now Amanda competes at 135 pounds and 145 pounds, mm. right? Bantamweight division and the featherweight division, mm. which are both male weight divisions as well. So what are we saying? What get her to fight a male at flyweight at 135 so, at a division below her? Who's she gonna fight? How would this work? And could she hang? Could she compete with men? We've already got people competing across belts, across weight divisions. Why should we not cross gender, uh, cross uh, male female mm. gap as well? Not regularly. I think it might be something for someone like Amanda Nunes, who's won seven title defenses in a row. She's got what two titles at the moment. What else is there? Why not see if she can beat a man in the so, same weight category? So, so the, great, the, the greatest crossover event in history. <laughs> and let, let's let's be let's be fair. This is not going to be something that happens on a regular basis. I just I, I, I don't believe that the weight categories are completely equivalent. Um, mm. I, I think a, a woman at flyweight is is isn't as as, as powerful as a man at flyweight and it sounds controversial Ooh. but if a, a guy's gone through <laughs> a guy's gone through puberty with st- with testosterone in his veins it's 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 stupid to argue otherwise yeah for however the, for, the, for, for the purposes of of this argument i mean you know physiologically from a scientific perspective scientifically we, 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 we adopt we adopt the premise that physiologically men are stronger they they have more muscle mass they have uh, more bone density than women yeah yeah you know, ha- yes. having said that having said that there are exceptions and that amanda <laughs> nunes so, is an exception cyborg is an exception i would have loved to see cyborg compete with, in the men's division as well again i would i wouldn't i wouldn't make this a regular thing i wouldn't say that all mm. females sh- and males should be competing i just don't think it would be fair competition however I think Nunes stands a chance at. I, I, I would say she can compete guys. in the featherweight. I really think she can compete there. Juice her up a little. She might take it. She could take the oh, belt. <laughs> I, don't wow. I don't think she needs it. I don't think she needs a juice. I don't think she needs a juice. I think she. I think she's perfect it's, as is. She. She's I, a I, knockout I, artist, man. Uh, I don't know if she could take the belt, but I definitely think she can compete with the highest in uh, featherweight. I don't know if she'll take the title. Who currently holds the title at Featherweight? It's um, it's Cerudo, uh, well, Alexander Volkanovski. Oh. Vol- mm. Volk, bless you. Yeah, um, bless you. <laughs> um, do you, do yeah, you think be... she? Do you think she can take him? Honestly. So I'll give you <laughs> I'll give you my thoughts, right? Uh huh. Because of this physiological difference, um, okay. and I say this as uncontroversially as possible, what I think is that Amanda Nunes in the street to the untrained or amateur martial, martial artist would fuck anyone up, mm-hmm. right? She's the greatest female m- mixed martial artist of all time. There is nowhere in a, in, in, a, in a self-defense or martial arts situation that you're going to beat her if you are untrained mm-hmm. and if you, or even if you are an amateur. However, mm-hmm. in the UFC, we're talking about the top, top male fighters in the world. So, that is not a level playing field and you're not leveling the playing field by putting her down in weight uh, or anything because you're talking about somebody who's at the top of their sport as a female versus somebody who's at the top of the same sport as a male mm-hmm. in, a, in a, a context and a setting that relies almost solely on your physical prowess, mm-hmm. right? Now, to, to, to back this up or to contextualize it or just to give you food for thought, um, a while back, I remember Serena and Venus Williams claimed that they could beat any male tennis player 
who was ranked outside, I think the top 200, they said, uh, and they put it out. I don't know if it was a serious challenge, but somebody who was like 203rd ranked or whatever actually took them up on this challenge. And basically he beat Serena like 6-1 and he beat Venus 6-1 or 6-2, right? That we're talking about mm. like the 203rd or 205th ranked tennis player in the world mm. um, against, against, you know, if we think about Serena Williams, somebody who, who makes an argument for one for the greatest s- athlete of all time yeah just let alone say, female right? athlete, that's, let alone yeah, that's across female the board. or male like one of you're talking about one of the greatest athletes uh, regardless okay mm-hmm. you know what does that say she couldn't beat a player who is obviously inferior in skill in experience in mm-hmm. every single other aspect other than the physiological makeup or composition having of a penis was, was, that, was that what you're trying to throw out there so, so I, just, just one thing so um i don't think it's fair to say that nunez would only really stand a chance against an untrained person i think if okay so in a, amanda in any gym she would probably dominate most of the fighters in that gym let me let me cap off my point of view uh, mm-hmm. and add a caveat could she beat male fighters in the ufc yes could she could she compete consistently and win a belt in a male division? No, that's my opinion. Um, so yes, that is my caveat. I agree with what you're saying, and I don't. I I, I genuinely do think that she could be. Uh, if she went, I would love if she fought Henry Sudo, and I hope oh. that she would absolutely <laughs> ruin that little triple C cringe piece of shit. <laughs> but so yeah, could she beat up amateurs, people in the street, and even? UFC fighters, yes. Could she compete at the top level against the top UFC male fighters? No, that's why. Yeah, that's a different. That's a different conversation. So, so um, but but this conversation is opening a different door, right? So, like Sean said, that it's special cases. But if she moves up into a male division, you're opening the door for both ways, and then you have the the conversation of Fox dropping, having a sex change, going to the female division, and literally breaking skulls. Uh, no, I don't Fox. think. But yeah, it, I, it, I, it, it, that's yeah. when so th- like you said, it's special cases, but the door opens, and you you start asking big it's a, questions. It's a, it's a different it's a different situation though, because remember, you, if, for example, the only reason Izzy could fight Jan was because he's a champ, and he wanted to go for the champ mm. champ. Mm-hmm. He couldn't just he couldn't just step up and start fighting in that in that weight division consistently. I mean, he really could if he really wanted to, but you don't have that. You usually have champs mm. fighting champs for the specific belt. I don't think it would be a case of people crossing over just willy nilly. It would be literally excuse um, the pun. champs. Excuse the pun. <laughs> willy it, nilly. It would literally <laughs> it would literally be champ versus champ. It would be Nunes versus Volkanovski. Mm-hmm. Again, like you said, I don't think she would come out really well uh, who knows who knows i would love to see that i would pay to see that fight the thing is she's uh, got ridiculous precision really well excuse the pun <laughs> she 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 i mean nunez's precision in her punches is un, unmatched it's unbelievable to watch but yeah. once again i just what it comes down to knockout power i don't yeah. know if she's got the same knockout power as him sterling hey, doesn't shouting in power. your mic do i shout sterling? in my mic like this <laughs> <laughs> that is how sterling. i talk Okay. So Sterling, Sterling doesn't have knockout power. A lot of guys don't have knockout power, but they they'll they'll dominate still. They'll dominate on points. They might get the uh, fight to the ground. Oh man, it's it's who such knows? A who knows? Um, again, like, like you say though, um, if it was, uh, for example, someone like Fallon Fox who uh, was born a male mm. and went through the pr- procedure to become uh, a female, unfortunately, Fallon Fox still went through puberty as a male. So they so so Fallon still develop the muscle the bone density everything that you would as a teenage and the boy. testosterone still was there like it's, testosterone it's, levels are still there so it wouldn't be fair to cross over that way i i don't i don't personally think it is what the general opinion might be might be different however i think it is okay for for females to say oh, okay i'll fight a male but not the other yeah, way around. that's it's it's it, like i said it's such a it, that's a controversial statement because like Fallon Fox going down, her last two fights, she literally cracked their skulls. It's- well, I mean, it's, it's <laughs> uh, Amanda's, Amanda's, what Amanda's done in the sport of mixed martial arts, it, it warrants this kind of conversation, yeah, it, it, doesn't it? But it, it, yeah. it, it justifies her she giving so the go. Dominant. Exactly. Yeah, she's so dominant. Exactly. She's so dominant. 
absolutely amongst agree. every other woman that she's ever fought that you know where else do you look yeah. honestly cyborg was, cyborg to, was the same if mm. she had to go to dana white and say let me have a go at someone in the the featherweight is, uh, division i i don't think there's much standing in his way to say okay yes there is yes there is there's uh, like athletic state commission rules okay, and okay. Yeah, yeah there's there there is i don't okay. i don't see it as a bunch of red tape uh, yeah I okay from a red tape perspective i think it's difficult but i mean to justify him saying no on purely based on skill and gender i don't think he he has much to back it up I don't think he would want to. Ba- I don't think he would want to deny that fight. I think it would be the legislation, the yeah. red tape, that would stop him from doing it. Um, I, th- yeah. I think he's he's like any other fighter. I think he wants to see a fight happen. And Nunes, I think, is a very, very capable of dominating a male fighter. I, I just mm. do. Volkanovski, maybe not. I would mm. love to see that fight. Who knows? Mm. I think yeah. that would also open up a, a huge, another can of worms if if she had to walk into a ring with. Volkanovsky and gets absolutely dominated then you start then the battle of the genders happens again and but that's yeah it's a huge yeah. what, what, what happens what happens if Nunes dominates him imagine I mean, I mean that's that's but that's the dream that yeah. open that opens the conversation of should we start combining certain weight classes to allow for a, a mixed gender division but once again if it doesn't happen then you go down the route of things that happened with Fallon Fox where people actually claimed it was abuse. It was a form yeah. of abuse allowing her, him, I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that one hit me. Um, uh, it's what, it was a form of abuse allowing him to compete in that division. That's what, yeah. so that, yeah, that's basically- what the females in that, the actual females in that division were saying, this is a form of abuse to allow her to come and compete here. And I, I, the people would, who would, were in those fights with her said when they got hit, it was a different punch. It, it was something they'd never experienced before. And it, it's something they've never experienced since because that was a different muscle mass coming through. I would liken it to, um, to Craig and Sean fighting. <laughs> what would happen, boys? <laughs> what would happen in a fight between Craig and Sean else? I'll let Craig answer. <laughs> well, <laughs> the, 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 the last time we tried, we were like 12. No, probably about 9 or 10. And he punched me and I cried. So that was probably the last <laughs> thing that happened. It's the rule of the so, older brother, yeah, mate. Yeah, it's universal. It is, it, 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 it but uh, you can ask Sean about sport. Sean was better than a lot of people I competed against, but he couldn't beat me. Craig likes to take things out of context. Eh? <laughs> let, let me, no, no, let me, let me explain something to you. Craig is my <laughs> kryptonite. Quite literally, he's my kryptonite. I will beat everyone who beats him, yeah. but he beats me. Yeah. I don't get it. It's 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 the weirdest thing. But yeah. once again, it, that's just how it is. Okay, well let's uh, let's move on. In Although you do kick my ass at a lot, Craig. Legitimately, <laughs> yeah. you do. Uh, let's not sell it short. You do kick my ass at a lot. We've got oh, this on record. <laughs> Okay, let's move into a preview of Fight Night 187 coming up this weekend. Leon uh, Edwards, yeah. the number three ranked welterweight versus uh, Bilal Mohammed, who is number 13 ranked welterweight. Now, if I look at the stats, we are seeing that Bilal Mohammed, uh, throughout his career has mostly won decisions. 72% of his wins have come through decision. Uh, and another interesting fact, they are both 18 and three. In yeah. mixed martial art. That's mixed crazy. Mar- hey, mixed martial, martial arts, arts makes a return. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Welcome yeah. back. <laughs> Today, uh, Junior. <laughs> 18 wins, 18 wins and three losses. Oh. So a win for Edwards, however, could put him into the running for cementing a title challenge next. So, so what are we saying about this fight? And what are we saying about who is challenging um, Kamaru Usman for the mm. welterweight title next? Have you have you seen the have you seen the height difference between these two guys? They're both at 170 uh, pounds. Um, Leon Edwards is sitting at a six foot two, and Bilal is five foot eleven. Yeah, that's quite a difference. I would that's imagine a, he has a I would imagine he has a, a, a distinct reach advantage then as well. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So that's that's substantial. But they're both strikers, so that when it comes to reach advantage, that's huge. Uh, but I believe Bilal's actually purple belt, same as you, Sean, uh, in jiu-jitsu. Um, 
Sean's a blue we both, Ah, sorry. Yeah, so I, he's... I've still, got, I've still got like two years to go until I still brothers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> listen, <laughs> we try. Um, Did so... you get my newsletter, Greg? It's in the <laughs> newsletter. The, fa- <laughs> the, the monthly notification. Um, <laughs> yeah, my family newsletter. <laughs> <laughs> That fucking WhatsApp group. So it's <laughs> so the the uh, when it, when it comes to them both being strikers and one having that substantial reach over the other, that that creates a different kind of question, man. But so I actually predict- don't know what Leon Edwards' uh, grappling game is. I don't know what his what what he's into, uh, what his qualifications or his backing is. I'm not too sure. I, d- I don't know much about Leon Edwards. I mean, I've watched his fights, but I've never really paid attention and really done mm. the research. But I- I'd give this one to Leon Edwards. Definitely. Mm. What's your prediction, Sean? What round and how? I think Leon Edwards is going to have a difficult one with this. I think he's going to take it by decision. Hey, man. The Palestinian's a hard man. Um, it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go below. Um, below. Hmm. Both strikers. Third round. How? Uh, by uh, TKO. TKO. Mm. Okay. I'm going to go with Leon Edwards, and I'm going to say that he gets it done via a TKO in the second round. Mm. Nice. Now, the other thing about <laughs> this card is that uh, uh, the South African Don Madge was supposed to fight on it. Oh, man. Um, but he had to pull out because he couldn't get a visa to the US in time. He was supposed to leave for his fight to the US today and he couldn't get a visa. So that's disappointing. He's 2-0 and in the UFC um, and he, you know, everyone is super excited about him back home here in, in South Africa. However, the cool thing is that next week's, uh, next weekend's fights, we have another South African who's competing, mm. uh, Drikas Duplessis, Drika still yeah, knocks. He still knocks. Mr. Yeah. Still knocks himself. Yeah. <laughs> uh, who is a, uh, a former middleweight and welterweight champion in the EFC here in Africa. Mm. Um, he's from Hatfield in Pretoria. So if there's any uh, students at Tux listening, uh, they'll know all about him. But he's, uh, he's 17 and 2 in MMA and he's 1 and 0 in the UFC. He had a, a really impressive KO over uh, Marcus Perez in his previous fight. Uh, he's famous, actually, Sean, for the guillotine choke. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think he's got four or five or six of them in his career so so we'll, we'll we'll dive a little bit deeper into that one next week because um, mm-hmm. that will be quite it's always um novel as well for us as south africans when we when we get mm-hmm. a south african into the ufc uh, it doesn't happen very often come on donnie get it together we want to see you in there <laughs> oh yeah that's super disappointing yeah visa issues if <laughs> only all right boys closing yeah. thoughts sean what are you saying about uh, anything in general in the world? In general, in the <laughs> in world. In the world, uh, in, in today. <laughs> it's your birthday I cannot. In, uh, in, two, in an hour and a half, isn't it? It's yeah, already yeah. his birthday in Dubai. Happy birthday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, dude, I cannot wait for lockdown to end. Um, it, it, it's, it feels like forever since I've trained. Um, it's been lockdown since uh, before Christmas. And what? It's, we're in March at the moment. It's painful, man. It's painful, but yeah. So Sean, uh, Sean in the UK undergoing a hard lockdown. Um, that's his final thought for tonight. And Sean, we wish you uh, a very merry Christmas and a happy birthday uh, for tomorrow. <laughs> Craig, closing thoughts. Oh man, uh, I'm just keen to get into this weekend and see what happens. Um, I'm learning something new every single week, and I just saw there's some new ads popping up on my Facebook for. Uh, some Muay Thai gyms popping up in Dubai. So I'll probably start doing some exploration. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Ke- keen for That's that. Exciting. <laughs> but uh, yeah, if anyone wants to go and uh, check out any of our um, uh, podcasts use, or any use of your words. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any of our podcasts as well, uh, you can go to any of the major platforms. You can go see them there or whatever platform you use. Uh, or if you want to see our gorgeous faces, uh, make your way to YouTube, um, YouTube forward slash Strictly Fighters. Um, yeah, and then, the yeah, also, uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about uh, what Sean thinks about jiu-jitsu and the different fight styles and uh, want to read some of our blog posts and learn a little bit more and uh, progress your fighting styles, strictlyfighters.com, that's where you got to do it, Matt. And that's it from me. 
Cool, guys. And if you're if you're enjoying the podcast, if you're enjoying the, the knowledge and the insight that we try to bring, if you're enjoying the 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 shit talk and the banter between us, um, spread the love. Give us a subscribe on on the platform that you use. Uh, give mm-hmm. us a share, um, and let's build our like. community. <laughs> give us a like. Give us a comment. I, t- I typically try to stay away <laughs> from those two, but you know, uh, Sean's always there with. Um, Sean's always there to catch us when we fall. So thank you for that. <laughs> uh, we, we enjoy a good comment. <laughs> yeah. well, so like, guys, it's all about community. It's all about conversation. So if mm-hmm. you have anything that you think uh, you, is worthwhile adding to this conversation, if there's anything we got wrong, uh, bring it to our attention. We want to have conversations. Talk to us. We'll yeah. talk back. Or if Get you have a problem with Sean's receding hairline, throw it in there. We'll have a chat. <laughs> Listen, my hairline has stopped <laughs> receding. It's, it's going to stay there until it's, the day I die. Yeah, it's receded. It's good. It's receded. <laughs> it's done. Final tense. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for the chat this week. Um, we'll be back next week with another episode uh, of Strictly Fighters. Sure, bye bye. Cheers. Later.